I've been a motorcycle mechanic since 1975 officially in shops and then some years before that where I just work on guys bikes if they'd let me ride them before I had a license and uh, was lucky enough to ride a 750 Norton Commando S that 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 pretty much set the tone for how I thought a motorcycle ought to handle like a bigger motorcycle. I think I might have been good at physics. I might be good at physics, basic physics, because um, you know most of our machines, it's there's leverages and there's proportions of things, and you have to have some kind of instinct for that to um, to be able to sort of sail on your own without just following rules and stuff. I started working on things, exploring machines trying to figure things out, make them work better when I was about five and onwards. And thanks to my dad's HO scale model railroad tools and clocks and mixers and anything in the house. And uh, later on, I'd go to the neighbors and ask them if their lawnmower needed a tune-up in the spring. and. And they'd laugh, oh no, Ken, the lawnmower is fine. And others would say, oh yeah, okay. Well, I'd take the lawnmower home, take it completely apart, and uh, put it back together. And it would always run great, but truly it never needed to be utterly taken apart. But I needed to take it entirely apart to figure it out. I also had neighbors across the back lane that were drag racers and sprint car racers. And uh, I, I, was a terrible leech. I hung around those guys. I They couldn't shake me. I, I washed parts in a little dish with Varsol so much my hands were split and bleeding and stuff from the Varsol drying out my skin. And I did anything. I helped grovel under cars, helping little Kenny, helping lift transmissions in and stuff like that. I, I, I just drank it up. But one of those guys, Jim Patterson, was a really big influence on how to do clean mechanicing, like do fine work cleanly and how important it was to be clean with your work. Because uh, uh, I like to say that people are really good at eating shit, but motors aren't, you know? Like, you gotta be clean. They can't clean themselves. One of the shops I worked at was one of the major drug dealers in Winnipeg. And um, so the, the police were always uh, on our phones and, you know, raiding the shop and whores were coming by for their cocaine and, you know, it was just a really fun scene for a young guy. <laughs> bike shops, bike shops were wilder back then than they seem to be now. I've got my grade 12 and that's as far as I could stand being formally educated. It was really annoying, the formal education business. Um, but I've read a lot of books, uh, read magazines and books, technical books. I've got books from MIT, um, technical engine, engineering books and stuff like that. But really the biggest influences in my reading were grumpy Bill Jenkins had a book, um, that you'd buy in a hot rod shop on, on tuning you know, building race motors out of uh, small block Chevys. And so that book, there was a great deal of information in there that meant a lot to me. And uh, another source similar to that was Smokey Eunuch, who was uh, really top end, sometimes radical, always pushing the limitations of rules. They They invented a lot of rules because of Smokey Eunuch, because of the crazy things he tried and did on stock cars. So stock car racing and drag racing influences, but both really fine engine tuners and inquisitive guys and uh, pushing out the limits all the time with these engines. Uh, they're very impressive characters and uh, I learned a lot about port shapes and things just from reading their books. Uh, 76 or 77 on my Liberta SFC, which was a superb bike to start racing on. Um, maybe uh, how, how I got to have that bike or be interested in that bike. Um, 
while I was buying tires, it was at this BMW shop in Winnipeg called BVW. Uh, I went in there, and there's just this one guy there, their mechanic, uh, Bruce, working there. And uh, as I came in, I saw this orange bike sitting across the showroom in this sea of BMWs. And the BMWs were okay, but uh, they just didn't really interest me. But there's this orange thing with a fairing on it and this huge long gas tank, and this little seat way back there, and these little handlebars way up. I said to Bruce, like, well, how the hell do you even ride this thing? Like, like, how does a human ride this thing, fit it? And uh, I sat on it, and I'm all laid out. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like, this is crazy. And, uh, and then uh, we talked about it a bit, and then he, he started it up. Anyways, this thing had the 2 into one meg on it, and he fires it up in the showroom inside the shop and wham, wham, he's revving it up and the thing's dancing and shaking around on its center stand and the hair's standing up on my arms and I'm like holy fuck holy fuck and uh, <laughs> I, I went back to the shop every day for a week like and bought it on the Friday <laughs> so that was how I got my first Italian bike and I went up to watch a race because I'd never seen a race before so uh uh, I just went up, I was wearing like a, I didn't even have a motorcycle jacket, I don't think, I had a dress leather jacket with bare wrists and work gloves, leather work gloves, work boots on, and jeans. No, I had wallabies, Clark's wallabies on, because they were comfortable. I liked how they felt on my foot pegs. And um, I get up there to watch, and these guys are all flipping out, because I got this bright orange, obvious race bike. And they're going, oh, you got to race, you got to race. Because they've got all clapped out Triumphs and, you know, Nortons and things. And, uh, you know, I had, like, this great bike. So uh, they finally, I said, no, I'm not going to race. I got no leathers, no nothing. I, you know, I'm not going to kill myself for you guys. But um, they said, well, at lunch, follow Hank around. Hank Burkers had the lap record at the time on a, on a BMW. He's a good rider. So during the lunch break, I follow Hank around and, you know, he's cruising around steady pace and I'm following him and he goes faster slowly and then, you know, I'm just following and following and following and then we come in and, and everybody's jumping up and down and they're going, oh, you guys set a new lap record. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> I can do better than that. So, uh, um... In my first practice session of my first ever race weekend, um, I got timed at, I think it was, I think it was a minute six, minute six seconds, so nine seconds off the lap record in my first ever practice session of my first ever race weekend, so I'm still impressed with that, but, um, but things were pretty crude. The other competition, like the, the bikes they had, like, you know, I had a major, major advantage. I'd had a lot of police problems, uh, speeding tickets and dangerous charges and, and crashes. And, you know, I've hardly got hurt in my motorcycle crashes, except for one that really just about did me in. But um, broke my neck and a bunch of hands and all kinds of stuff. But... Uh, um, I, it became obvious to me that motorcycles were running my life in a way I didn't like, like I owed everybody I could owe money to money and the bikes were just demanding it, it seemed to me, but, um, I, since I think I've realized that I, I suffer from being OCD and I go down rabbit holes and I can't help myself, I don't even try to help myself, so. This is a problem. But uh, so I, I quit motorcycle racing and even riding on the street because it was just frustrating. You're just watching for cops all the time and it was like, I just want to ride, you know. But then also my race tuning got to higher and higher levels pretty quickly. And uh, so then that, it was like I had to choose to ride or to race tune. So I went off to, to the big world of race tuning and uh, was traveling down east in Canada and then into, into the States doing some AMA stuff. And um, 
That was good. I learned lots. Uh, uh, I've always been competitive, so to put your wrenching up against other guys, the best guys in Canada and some of the best guys in the States and see where you stand. Pete Holzinger was an early friend I, I made uh, with motorcycles and uh, we rode together a lot. And, uh, and then he started racing and then when I quit racing, I went and built his bikes, motors and set up chassis and stuff and then helped him tune at the track. And uh, that went pretty well. Pete's a great rider, so he made my work look good. So if you're ever going to be a race tuner, you want to hook up with a great rider or else you're not going to look very good. <laughs> so always, yeah, that, that helped. Pete helped. I'd spotted a guy that was, he was in the amateur class, in a triple nine, red numbers, and he's just smoking everybody. He's way in the lead. He's really smooth, and I think, oh man, here's some, some old guy like me who's previously raced. He's got back into it after some years off, and he's just cherry-picking. He should get the hell out of the rookie class and let somebody else win, you know? And that was it. You know, I was busy with Pete Holzinger's stuff, and then later, I'm, I'm, the next day, I'm at home at my shop. I'm working out of home then, and this, this trailer pulls up, and it's uh, Benoit Pilon is one of the guys with one of the bikes. It's his trailer. And this guy, this guy and his son wheel this bike up and say, you know, we heard you were mechanicking and, you know, do you think you could fix our bike for the next national out at Westwood? And uh, I go, yeah, yeah, for sure I can. And, uh, so which one of you guys is the rider? Because there's this dad and there's this little kid. And, well... The kid says, I am. I go, what? How old are you? And he's, he says, oh, I'm 19. I go, oh, okay. And it uh, was Jacques Gannette Jr. And uh, later I worked with uh, Benoit Pilon. So, uh, and um, he was another really wonderful guy to work with uh, and hang out with. A really fun, happy guy. He was almost too happy to be a racer because I think you have to have some kind of angst that's driving you, so you just want to destroy everybody else on the track. And Ben was too happy for that, I think. He was too well-balanced and happy guy. But great rider, lovely rider. And um, I worked with uh, Ben, with, that was with the OW01 Yamaha. That was a very good bike. That was quite a quantum leap in street bikes, or super bikes. Um, was the first of the perimeter chassis carbs up at a very steep angle, better induction, really good cold air inlets to the air box, uh, fuel tank, which is basically a cylinder, vertical cylinder, so as the fuel load went down, it didn't change weight bias front to rear, it just got easier to ride. You know, a whole bunch of really, really smart things and a good stiff frame, brilliant bike. Um, deeply flawed by the five valve combustion chamber though. You couldn't get any compression out of the thing because of all these valve pockets and compression's king. That's how you make horsepower, you know. So, um, yeah, that was that was too bad. It was a great bike with a a reliable but down on power motor. Yeah, so it was Ben Pilon. I did some other work with uh, Gannett's um, at various races in the states. Uh, we did Daytona a couple of times, different ways. Daytona is fun. It's like uh, you're like in this big fishbowl of motorcycle racing, and this the whole world is out on the outside. You don't have a clue what's going on. You're just in total motorhead fishbowl, and uh, it's also like a trade show. So I got to meet the top guys of a whole bunch of different things. Like I got I got uh, Yoshi from Kahin to get me some special needles straight from Kahin that I couldn't buy anywhere else and got them to my own spec and oh man all kinds of cool things and met different industry guys that it was it was really like a trade show with a motorcycle race it was a super cool event that uh, the trade show aspect was wonderful but it's a brutal event on a race team because most teams don't have a, a decent budget and uh uh, most teams blow their whole racing budget at Daytona and then they're screwed for the whole rest of the racing season because it's a 
you're there for quite a few days and it's a long track and all its screaming revs it just wears equipment out and uh yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend to not go to Daytona. Avoid Daytona, it just eats up equipment. It's gonna cost you money. You won't be any further ahead. You'll pop out broke and destitute at the end of the race week. <laughs> and then outside the racetrack, when we dared to go outside the racetrack, is pretty freaky. There's all these bankers dressed up like bikers and long-haired bikerish looking people with, with like black stocking things on with razor cuts in them, um, looking like maybe they wanted to be strippers in a 80s strip club or something. I don't know what, it, all these weirdos are on the street. It's like, oh, let's go back to the racetrack fish tank now and let's just be motorheads again. But, but we just, I just had a, a new baby at that point, our, our Max boy, Sharon and I had Max and I thought, well, you know, I could look around me and see, you know, lots of the race mechanics that I could see around me had either pharmaceutical problems, cocaine problems, or alcohol problems, uh, dysfunctional relationships on the road 10 months of the year kind of thing. Like, I just thought, ah, this is kind of, this is something I've wanted for a long time in my life is to be a top level race tuner and in some ways it's still like the most fascinating thing but but the downside is is like a shit lifestyle <laughs> so i i think that's where that was my that's where i first actively pulled back on my race tuning involvement um i realized that i'd rather be dad and be a good partner husband sort of guy than then be some guy in some motel room somewhere else on the planet uh, nursing a hangover and getting up and working on bikes again and uh, some of the some of the aspects of working on the motorcycles that people don't know about or think about is the race gas is so toxic I know it probably still is but it sure was back then like you know, if you smelled enough race gas in a day, you'd have the most horrible sickness and headaches, and it was horrible, horrible stuff to work around. I'm pretty sure it's cancer in a can, that stuff. So I was happy to get away from that, but mainly I just wanted to be dad. And for the motorcycle business in general, um, it seems to me that since the advent of Hondas back in the day where you you meet the nicest people on a Honda from those magazine ads back then. You're getting more and more of these nice people and that's all there is left anymore. There's hardly any motorcyclists left anymore in my brutal opinion. And it seems to be what I would consider a really large amount of posers, like people that only seem to own the motorcycles so they can wear the leather jacket legitimately. And I think, I, maybe I'm wrong, I really hope so, but it, it seems like it's all about the look and the pose and not many people are really riders, you know, but uh, like I say, hopefully I'm wrong and I'm probably from a jaded old guy viewpoint, but uh, um, you know, like motorcycles used to get more powerful, faster, better, and they still are in a lot of ways, but, but who's going to ride these things? Like the youth of today, aren't really showing up in droves. Uh, the old guys are old and most of them barely know how to ride as it is. They hold up traffic on the highway. That never used to happen. A motorcycle holding up traffic on the highway? Like hilarious. And uh, yeah, uh, so I, I, don't know, I don't know what the future of motorcycles and this business is going to be and along with, you know, concerns for the um, you know, carbon emissions and all that stuff too. It's like, we got to start changing our ways to be healthier, to sustain life on this planet. But uh, I don't know what all the radical changes are going to be, but uh, I think a good thing to do would be to make great bikes that are affordable and simple 
so that a young guy could buy them and enjoy riding them and afford to keep them running. And uh, nobody needs ballistic bikes on the street. Like, I had trouble keeping my driver's license with 75 horsepower. Like, what do you do with 214 horsepower? You know, like, you got to be kidding. Like, on the street, you know, who needs that? Um, it's just, uh, you know, anyway, but for the young guys... I guess these Ducati scramblers, um, BMW's got some new bike I saw at the show, there's several different models of a pretty nice looking bikes, uh, looking fairly simple and like a basic motorcycle again, I thought that's what, like we should be riding basic motorcycles uh, and they should be good ones uh, so that somebody can actually enjoy them and maybe actually want to carry on with motorcycles in their life instead of just forget it, I can't afford that, or I can't ride that, you know. So maybe that's the direction to go is, is get simpler and smaller and cheaper, but still use good geometry, as good components as you can and to make it a, a good machine, but still have a profit, but sell more. Sell cheaper bikes, but sell more, a lot more. And then there'd be less carbon emissions from less monster trucks. Briefly tried working at a shop again, and it didn't go very well. Um, I, it was a lot of different brands of bikes, a lot of different models, really frustrating. You're never expert. You're, you're only seeing this thing the first time while you're working on it and trying to be efficient for a reasonable time spent on a job is really hard on the first time you see something and when it's always first time. Anyways, I got offered a stress reducing pay reduction on that job and I thought that was one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. This guy could, he could run a religion with logic like that, but <laughs> and he could do well. But uh, yeah, I just kind of went, to, oh, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow about that. Uh, you know, anyways, I rode my bicycle down the road in the middle of the afternoon on a perfectly sunny afternoon when fuck it feels good to get out of there what am i going to do <laughs> i don't want to work at any other shops in town they're even worse you know like what am i going to do so i thought well i guess i'll just start working at home again my own little shop so i just hope i still have some kind of reputation that maybe people will bring their bikes to some guy random guy working out of his shop at home so I started doing that again and that's been wonderful it's been great I get to listen to really good music I get to have really good lighting um, a drawback is I can't there's there's no silly ass banter I can, there's no humor in my shop I can't joke around with anybody so it's just me by myself CJSW radio station saves my butt I got some kind of human input there but uh, so anyway, that's what I looks like I'm going to be doing for the rest of my days uh, is working in my own little shop, which is pretty happy. I'm working on some cool projects, an old race bike I built for one of my best customers in 1989. It's back in my hands again to make it into a track day bike, and uh, that's that's really cool. Uh, I've got a 749R out there right now. <laughs> to try not to fall in love with. So I'm pretty happy to work on one of those again. Um, so that's my own little scene uh, as I go drifting off into the sunset. Um, maybe there's some other grand exploits to come, but I don't know what they'd be just yet.